burnt to death, when kids execute soldiers, when people are out there being beheaded. I'm sorry, but this is the time to stand up and be counted. Get some guts and join the right side. Hello and welcome to Coffee with Switzerland. and today I'm talking to Sir John Key, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and someone who I think everyone should know. John, thanks for coming. Joining Peter, us. thanks very much. Look, John, um, I've always loved you ever since I saw you do that Thank fantastic uh, <laughs> comeback at the Labour yeah, yeah, yeah. Party. Over. Can you just quickly explain why you got stuck into them and t- told them about some guts? Yeah, yeah. So what happened was New Zealand was really the only country of the sort of major sort of you know, coalition, if you like, yeah. that, that had the opposition opposed to us going to Iraq mm. uh, to provide training troops. Mm. And so we wanted to train alongside the Aussies mm. and the Americans at Taji Air Base. Yeah. And, and as, as, as much as it can be, you know, a safe environment. And the, and the Labour Party just opposed it because they... Look, they wanted me to be responsible if someone lost their life there, I mm. think. And mm. I, I, I understood that, but we had to do the right thing. I mean, you, you had the Taliban mm. doing the most despicable things over there, and, mm. I, and I just didn't know what ISIS, should I say. Mm. And so I just, I just didn't believe that we could, with all good conscience, do nothing. Mm. And so in the end, in a pretty feisty debate, I told them, you know, get on the right side and do the right thing. Yeah. Had, had you planned it? Because <laughs> No. Yeah, it just, it just no, came just from the heart. Rip. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. just let rip. Well, I must admit, if you haven't seen it, go just put uh, <laughs> YouTube, John Key, get some guts, get and some it comes guts. up. Yeah, it's okay, fantastic, okay. mate. Great. So, uh, John Key, pre-PM, yep. in a nutshell. Where'd you come from? Investment banker, really. So I've got an accounting degree. Yeah. Um, I worked a little, little bit of time at Deloitte's, but really went to Bankers Trust mm. and then Merrill Lynch. Mm. The last sort of 18 years overseas, running global foreign exchange, European derivatives, and the European e-commerce business. So I ran the only global business Merrill had outside of New York. So I was in London based. Mm. Had a, a year in Singapore on the way through, and a year in Sydney on the way home, and then 2002 came back and ran for politics. Why did you go to politics? Yeah, I'd always wanted to do that. So when I was kind of 11, apparently I rumoured to walk around saying I was going to be Prime Minister. Oh, really? Which, you know, a lot of 11-year-old kids do, but they grow out of it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think your motivations, truthfully, when you're 11 mm. are quite different to when you're 40, mm. uh, which is how old I was when I went in. Yeah. Uh, but Investment I, bankers tend to be different from kids, or, or aren't yeah, they? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes yeah. I, you know, some of their behaviour might <laughs> be similar. Yeah, because, uh, look, uh, in the end, I always believe New Zealand was an amazing country that underperformed and I could play a role along with a big team at transforming that and I think there's a bit of an argument over the sort of eight nine years I was PM that we really did take New Zealand to another level now yeah it's a it's a journey not a destination so it never ends and, and there are always challenges but we had the Christchurch earthquakes the global financial crisis mm. you know we had Pike River Mines us we had a lot of things to deal with in that time and New Zealand came out being described by HSBC as the rock star economy so it was yeah. pretty, quite strong yeah and uh, even the All Blacks improved under your uh, tutelage never lost I n- they never <laughs> lost in the entire time I was Prime Minister mm. when I watched them live never lost mm. Never lost a World Cup. Under I knew you were going to say this. I mean, you know, I just, I, I mean, I know there's a Blues Low Cup coming yeah. up. I, you know, I know the Wallabies will talk themselves down and then you know, come back at us as they so often have. But <laughs> look, in the end, the record is the record. Yep, unbroken. it sure is. Yeah. Um, your first night as Prime Minister, could you remember it? Yeah, absolutely. No, no. I, well, election night 08 mm. um, was was an amazing sort of feeling for mm. a start off. I mean, technically, you're not Prime Minister, so you're not Prime Minister elect, but. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just that sense. There's a sense of amazing excitement and a slight degree of trepidation that, holy hell, now, you know, the buck sort of stops with me. Um, and uh, for a bit of a laugh, when we got up the next morning, my wife cutesy. Nice <laughs> it's a nice touch, honey. After that, there were no more cutesing. <laughs> no more. I was just going back to put the rubbish bins out and feed the cat. <laughs> but, yeah. What was your, the shock revelation of being a PM? You never had yeah. ever thought of it, but you, yeah. you got that revelation because you're in your job. Yeah, so I thought um, decisions would make themselves. I know that sounds crazy, mm. but you're surrounded by an army of officials. I mean, how many people work in the core public service mm. providing advice to the Prime Minister and the Cabinet? And I just thought, look in the end, these are bright people and they'll sort it out. But what you realise is all the easy decisions are made long before they get to your table. And if you do end up taking them to Cabinet, mm. quite frankly, they last two-second discussion in the mm. Cabinet room. 
what inevitably ends up happening is the Prime Minister is the chairman, if you like, of, of effectively the, you know, the cabinet and therefore the board, mm. and you have to make those calls. Mm. And if it's, say, I don't know, oil and gas exploration, you'll have the environmental people arguing one case, you'll have the economic team arguing another. You have to make that call, and it can't always just be on one side, mm. um, but it is amazing how much you've got to do that and carry that argument. And I just naturally thought those decisions would be more obvious that there's a lot more divided decisions than you think. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the most impressive international leader you had to deal with, or, or enjoyed dealing with? Yeah, I mean, as a person, the Queen is the most remarkable person. Right. We, we were really lucky. I think I was the only Australasian Prime Minister to be invited to Balmoral, and we mm -hmm. stayed with you know with my wife and kids. Mm -hmm. And she is amazing. She has had every US president, every you know every mm -hmm. person you can imagine, yeah. and the stories are just. Incredible. Um, look, Obama was 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 great. I, mean, I was friendly with him. I mean, he's he's quite different from me in a lot of ways. I'm much more sort of centre right and business friendly, and he's sort of less. Um, but at, you know, just as an orator, mm. um, quite a remarkable you know person. Angela Merkel is the mm. centre right politician. Yeah. She's amazing, determined, yeah. amazing, mm. no mucking around. But, you can but good German. to deal with. One last thing. Yeah. For someone who is aspirational, as you clearly yep. were, and, and had a, a big hang, a big yep. aerial dangerous goal, mm. what advice would you give the, the, that sort of person who's watching this now? Yeah, it's so two things. Um, my mother always said to me, who was an Austrian Jewish refugee, got out of Austria in 1938 when the Nazis were maybe 37, she said, look, you know, you get out of life what you put into it. And I, and I do think you can make your own luck. Obviously, you need some good things to happen along the way, but, you know, that's one thing. And I think the second thing is, I just, I never wanted to die wondering. You know, I always had this ambition to be Prime Minister. Mm. I wanted to leave a mark, if you like. Mm. And there are all sorts of motivations why people want to do those things. But when I go to my grave, I'm, I'm going to be an unusual Prime Minister. I'm going to go happy because mm. I'm going to look back and think, yeah, the public were great. I gave it a good go. I enjoyed the things I did. Yeah, I made some mistakes and I got some things right, hopefully, but I'm not going to die wondering. And I think for anyone that is really ambitious, for whatever it might be, my advice to them would be don't be afraid of, of failing. You know, give it everything you got. If you don't make it, people will still be proud of you that you gave it a go and you gave it your best. Cheers, mate. Okay, mate. Thanks very much. Good, good having coffee with... Uh, Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's Coffee with Spitzer. Thanks for joining us.